Hi everyone, this is Matt Ingram with a uh, short lesson on linear regression. Uh, this is also called OLS regression, ordinary least squares, or sometimes simply least squares regression. Uh, most of the time, uh, folks shorthand this method simply as regression. This the examples that will be included in this lesson in R are derived from uh, Philip Pollock's R Companion to the Essentials of Political Analysis, uh, Chapter 8, specifically pages 108 to 115. So it would be most helpful if you uh, had the R Companion workbook open to those pages. This R script is also loaded up to the course website. So I also strongly suggest that you download the R script uh, and also have it open uh, alongside the video. So in the ideal uh, situation, you'd have your R workbook open next to you, have R open with this R script uh, available to you, and then watch the video and execute the commands as we move through the video. Throughout the video, you can see the cursor in this sort of uh, translucent red. I'm moving it around in a circle here. I'll try to minimize the movement of the, of the mouse so that it's not too distracting. Also, occasionally I may zoom in or out. For instance, I might zoom in like this, and you can see the content of the window here in larger font. Um, if we're going to be looking in detail at some syntax, I might uh, uh, zoom in, uh, and then I might also zoom out as well. Occasionally I might do some notations on the screen. So starting on chapter uh, on page uh, 108 with uh, Pollock's example from the R workbook, the main research question is as stated in the notes here, and again the pound sign um, at the start of a line tells R that that's a comment for yourself, so it won't execute that line. For instance, if I were to highlight this line right here and hit Control R, it'll simply execute down here the comment, but there is there's actually no function performed or nothing that R computes. So the research question then is, what explains gender composition of U.S. state legislatures? And that is, we want to understand why, among state legislative bodies, there are more women in some state legislatures and fewer women in others. The dependent variable in this example is uh, women legislatures Women legislators. 2010 or W O M L E G. 2010, uh, as noted here, and the relevant data set is the state's data set, which you should have loaded in your R workspace. One thing that Pollock does not do in his example is just provide some brief descriptive statistics of the dependent variable of this outcome of interest. So let's do that first just to get a better sense of what the dependent variable is. I strongly suggest you do this every time you conduct an analysis just to um, <laughs> have, a, have a better idea of what your dependent variable looks like. So this is the um, um, uh, one, one way of looking at what your dependent variable looks like using the summary command. Again, we've used the summary command here. And just to review, you reference the data set and use a dollar sign to separate the data set from the variable name. So now you've referenced the data set and the variable name. Let's hit Control R to get a summary. And now down here in the bottom left, you see the result of this summary command. So the minimum value is 10, that is that in the state with the least amount of women in its legislature, that amount is 10%. So there are no states with less than 10% of its legislators uh, that are women. The median amount, that is that number that splits the distribution of, legis of states exactly in half, is 23.55. The average, the arithmetic mean, right, the arithmetic average, 
is 24.12, so on average 24% of state legislators are women. And uh, the state with the most female legislators has 37.5% of its uh, legislators who are female. Uh, a couple other commands that we can use to get a better sense of the dependent variable are describe. Describe is a much more d detailed version of the summary command. So again, we hit Control R once we've highlighted that to execute it. And again, down in the lower left, uh, we can see what this more detailed um, description of the variable looks like. We have 50 observations, right? The N is 50. That's 50 states. There are zero missing. 47 of those 50 states have unique values. That is, three states have values that are similar to other states. Again, the mean is 24.12. That matches the mean in the previous command summary. Uh, here we see the 50th percentile, that median, that value that splits the distribution exactly in half is 23.55, same as the median up here. And the maximum value, the highest value is 37.5, right? Again, same as the maximum value reported earlier. However, here you say the fifth, you see additional cuts at the fifth percentile. Uh, the 75th percentile, the 90th percentile, and the 95th percentile. And uh, underneath this screen here, there are some additional percentiles, right? The 10th percentile and the 25th percentile. Uh, plus, you see the lowest five values, 10, 11.4, 12.9, etc. And the largest five values. So describe is a much more detailed way of looking at the distribution of a variable. And lastly, we could do what we've done before in some of the earlier chapters in the R workbook is do a histogram of this variable. You'll note that previously Pollock had us use the weighted version of the histogram. So for instance, if I zoom in here, this is the plain version of the histogram. Pollock had us use a uh, command that was called WTID histogram, and then you'd have the contents of it there. And if th the data set did not require a weights variable, then you simply didn't have to specify it. So you could simply use this command. Uh, however, this histogram command over to the left is another command that you can use. So you've seen the weighted version of the command. And now you've seen uh, this more, say, simplified version of the command. So let's uh, zoom out here and execute this line. Again, highlight the line and hit Control R. And there's our histogram. So we can see the lowest value is around 10. The highest value is close to 40. And there's our distribution with most of the values lying between 20 and 25. So with this in mind, we have a better sense, now that I've closed that histogram window, we, uh, we have a better sense of what our dependent variable, our outcome of interest, looks like. And we can proceed with some of the other analyses. And the next step in the analysis is a correlation uh, as executed by Pollock um, on pages 115, uh, excuse me, the earlier pages are on 108 and 109, so this is exactly the same uh, command being executed on 108. <coughs> should note that the variables are will appear once you execute the command in the order that they are listed. So let's see what that looks like. Again, this is the exact same syntax that appears on page um, 108. And we've highlighted the line and hit Execute. And now if we minimize this window here, or shrink it, we can see these results over to the left. So let's zoom in a little bit and see what this looks like. 
we've got our correlations so as you would expect along the diagonal a variable should have a perfect correlation with itself right so you see the one identifying the perfect correlation between variable one and variable one variable two and variable two and variable three and variable three again the variables or names do not appear here but they are reported in the order in which they are listed so this would be variable one which is the attend percentage the percentage of the population that attends religious services variable two would be the percent of population that had obtained a college degree and variable three would be the percentage of women legislators the percentage of legislators that are female so these are our basic correlations uh, these are the standard errors reported <laughs> the t-values and then towards the bottom here the p-values and these give us the significance the t-values and the p-values are different ways of reporting the significance Again, so for the t-values we're looking for values above uh, plus or minus two or an absolute value of two and the p-values we're looking for values below 0.05 as a rule of thumb <coughs> so that's the first correlation command using this weighted uh, wtd.core command there are other options that are not mentioned by Pollock so a simpler version of the correlations command is this one which simply adds an S right here and if we hit control R you'll see the result of this and it's simply three lines so it simply re re reports the very first part of the previous command it simply reports the correlations now if we zoom back out and try a, a different command the COR command it does exactly the same thing. You can see this down here in the lower left. So this is wtd.cors and this is simply cor. Both of these commands very quickly report simply the correlations. So if you didn't want to know the p-values, t-values, standard errors, etc., you could simply use these two commands. The last command provides a little bit more information, but not quite as much as the first command. And again, we'll zoom back in to this lower left corner. So this R core command, R C O R R, reports the correlations exactly the same as the previous two commands in the first part of the first command. And then it reports the p-values and essentially is reporting the ones that have statistical significance where the zeros appear. And I'll zoom back out. And that's just a little bit of additional information about some alternate ways on how you can obtain correlations. These are three alternatives to this uh, principal mean provided by Pollock on page 108 in the R workbook. So we'll proceed now on page 109, continuing on page 109. Let's just write this in here. With uh, a regression of unweighted data. I'll zoom in here so we can take a closer look. The key command here in this section is the LM command. It stands for linear model. Uh, elsewhere, elsewhere in this chapter and in some of the exercises uh, in the next chapter, uh, Pollock uses the survey GLM. GLM stands for generalized linear model. Um, but this linear model is the simplest uh, and perhaps most utilized method for regression 
Uh, the first bivariate example starts on page 109 where he introduces this command. And essentially we're testing a possible relationship between the dependent variable, the percent of women, the percent of legislators who are women, and a first independent variable of interest, the percent of people who attend religious services, this attend percent variable. So this is the command provided to us by Pollock. We want to execute the command in here, in this portion of, of the syntax, on the portion within the parentheses. So this is the dependent variable listed first. There's the tilde, and then the independent variable, followed by a comma, and then referring, the, referring to the data set that we are using. If you enclose all of this within a parenthesis, as Pollock has done in his example, and include the summary command outside of it, then it'll s provide a summary report of the command that was executed. So let's zoom out and see what that looks like. Again, if we highlight this full line and hit Control R, you can now see that the output has been generated in the R console. If we zoom in over here and minimize this window somewhat, we can now see that this formula was called, regressing the percent of legislators who are women on the percent of the population that attends religious services using the state's data set. <coughs> and the most interesting part of this to us should be the coefficient estimate here, or rather this line, or these two lines really. Here we go. These two lines. And as Pollock tells us, these two lines give us uh, the information to establish the linear relationship or the formula for the line that represents the relationship between this independent variable and the dependent variable. Specifically, this intercept is the point at which the line crosses the y-axis. So this is the point where that the this is the value that the dependent variable takes if a 10% is zero. <coughs> and then the coefficient for a 10% gives us the information to interpret the relationship between the percent of the population that attends religious services and the percent of the state legislature that is composed of women. So for each percentage point increase in the population that attends religious services, there is a decrease, and we know this is a decrease by the negative sign, of almost half of 1%, 0.47 of a percent, almost half of 1% in the number of, in the percent of women who are in the state legislature. So this establishes a negative relationship between, say, the religiosity of a state population and the percent of women who reach the state legislature. And we know this relationship is statistically significant by looking at either the t-value or the p-value. As, as a rule of thumb, we're looking for t-values above an absolute value of 2. This is an absolute value of almost 6. So we know we're above that threshold. And then we're looking for p-values below 0 0.05, and in this scientific notation, this is well below that. This is probably uh, six zeros and then three seven one, six zeros to the left, to the excuse me, to the right of the decimal point. 
So this is far, far smaller than the 0.05 that we're looking for. So in plain English, the likelihood that the uh, relationship between the likelihood that we would see these results or establish a relationship between a population's religiosity and the percent of women in the state legislature is uh, purely coincidental, purely exists by chance, is, is very, very slim. Essentially, there, there's less than, far less than one thousandth of one percent uh, likelihood that we would expect to see these results purely by chance. As Pollock mentions, we'd like to look at the R-squared statistic as well. Normally there's more than one R-squared reported. Here th we'd like to look at the second one, the adjusted one, which is tends to be more conservative, that is, tends to be smaller than the first R-squared reported. And this gives us a, a general sense of the amount uh, of variation in the dependent variable that is explained by our independent variables, in this case a single independent variable. So here nearly 41 percent of the variation in our dependent variable is explained by this single independent variable. Let's zoom back out here and continue with the example. So this was the command that we just used. Again, I, c I could just repeat it right now, highlight it, and execute it. You see it again just right here. An alternate syntax is to generate an object. You could call it anything you like. I've called it model one. Uh, that is constructed by um, executing the function lm, linear model, on our variables very similar syntax to what we've seen up here. Essentially it's exactly what's within this inner set of parentheses. So if you execute this command and generate a new object with it, you can see that R has executed that command down in the lower left. And this has created a new object using those specifications. So now we can summarize that object. So essentially we're doing this basically summary of model 1 as we've just created it. And if we now execute this command, again control R, here's the command summary model 1 and we see exactly the same results, right? A 0.47 um, magnitude of decrease in the dependent variable for every one point increase in the independent variable R squared of adjusted R squared of nearly 0.41, all the same results. So this is just an alternative way of stating this. <coughs> if you're interested in very efficient syntax, you might want to stick to Pollock's standard way of formulating it, but I just wanted to provide this alternative way of doing it. The second bivariate example, starting on page 111, is mainly provided by Pollock to gain familiarity. I'm sorry, I didn't spell this correctly, familiarity. With the notion of regressing one variable, namely the dependent variable on another. This time, however, he's testing the relationship, uh, testing the effect of a separate, sort of a, a separate variable capturing, capturing an alternate hypothesis on the percent of uh, legislators that are women. So here he's testing the relationship between the percent of the population that is college educated on the percent of women, the percent of legislators who are women. We don't need to go through the full example as we did before, but just to show you the results, here's the, com the command as Pollock uses it. I'll create another space here before I execute it. So again, we're if we zoom in, we're executing the command linear model on the percent of women, uh, the percent of legislators who are women, on the independent variable college, which captures the percent of the population that is college educated, using the data set states. 
Once we've executed this function inside the inner set of parentheses, we want to summarize the results. So let's zoom back out, and we've got the function still highlighted, so I'll hit Control R to execute it. And here we have the results down here. As I've noted before, you could also use this alternate syntax and generate a separate object that consists of the linear model within the inner parentheses and then summarize that object. Either way will generate the same results. Let me just run both of these two lines just to generate the same results. And then let's zoom in down here to see what we've got. <coughs> so here we see essentially a positive relationship between the percent of the population that is college educated and uh, the dependent variable, the percent of legislators that are women. We know that by the positive sign on the coefficient. For college, and for every 1% increase in the population that is college educated, there is almost an equal 1% increase in the percent of the legislator legislature that is female, I think 0.94. So it's almost a one-to-one -one relationship. <coughs> Presumably, if you were to increase the percentage of, of the population that is college educated by 10%, the percent, the percent of, uh, of legislators who are women should also increase by 10%, right? It's a one-to-one -one relationship. We want to know whether this is statistically significant. Again, we go to our rules of thumb. Is this above an absolute value of 2? Yes, it is. Or alternately, is this below a value of 0.05? so that we could have at least 95% confidence in the statistical significance of the results. Yes, it is. Uh, so you could, you could either look exactly at this p-value, or, or you could reference the asterisks and, and reference their interpretation below. Three asterisks uh, take you well below uh, even 0 0.001. So we're well below the 0 0.05 threshold. In terms of what uh, proportion of the variation in the dependent variable is explained, we want to look at the two values of R squared, specifically at the second one, the adjusted R squared value. So college attainment on its own explains about 38% of the variation in the percent of the, of the state legislature that is composed of women. So we've looked at these two bivariate relationships as, as Pollock also walks you through them in, th in chapter 8. Let's zoom out and continue with the example, but now moving to multiple regression. Um, sorry, before we do that, we want to just generate a, a, a scatter plot and a bubble plot that he does. So let's do that on page. Sorry, this isn't page 81, this is page 112. Sorry for the confusion, I'll correct that right now. Um, so you could enter the command exactly as he does. I'll just highlight all of the syntax. It's exactly the same syntax that he has um, on page 113. And if we, now that we've had it highlighted, we hit Control R, and there is our scatter plot. And so you see here the proportion of the population that has a college degree or higher. You see here the percentage of the population, the percentage of the state legislator that is composed of women. And you see this positive relationship, right? The sort of a general trend moving from the lower left to the upper right for every one unit, for every unit of increase. In the independent variable, there appears to be some unit of increase. In the dependent variable, after doing the bivariate regression, we would expect that one-to-one -one relationship. You can see that here. That it would be easier to see if these uh, rectangles were actually perfect squares. But essentially what we're looking for is for this regression line to move from any one corner 
lower left corner of these rectangles to the upper right corner of these rectangles. So a line that essentially travels, let's see if I can uh, draw something here that roughly approximates what we would expect. We would want to see a line that roughly travels along these uh, diagonals of these recta rectangles, right? A one to roughly one to one relationship between um, the percent of the population that is college educated and the percent of the population, the percent of the state legislature that is composed of women. And that's exactly what we see, right? I've deleted the red line now, but you can see that this line roughly approximates that relationship. Let me close this graph and generate that bubble plot that uh, Pollock generates on pages 113 and 114. We're simply adding some symbols here. Uh, I should not have deleted that plot, so let's just do the whole thing here. If you deleted your scatter plot, you can just highlight all of the commands, including the comments. The comments will not be executed. So there's the bubble plot. Just for clarity's sake, let me just do the steps separately. Here's the scatter plot. Highlight all of the commands. Hit Control R, execute. There's the scatter plot. Don't delete it as I just did. Just go back to your R script and highlight the bubble commands to change the symbols. And now, if we look behind this R script, we should see those bubbles. There it is. <coughs> so, as I note here in these comments, um, you can turn the points of of any scatter plot into symbols of different shapes, colors, sizes to capture any second variable of interest. That is, you can alter the plotted points to visualize alternative explanations. Uh, you could even generate text to label the state names, etc. Right? We could we could add this line here, for instance, uh, which you have in the R script if you've downloaded it, and execute that, and that adds the state names. These state names are not in the R workbook, so if you're wondering where this graph came from because it's not in the R workbook, you need to execute this line to add uh, the state names to the graph. But again, these changing the symbols and adding some text helps to really make this graph very rich with information. You can see the positive linear relationship between college attainment and the composition of the, the female composition of the state legislature. And then in the size of each point, you can see the, the, the proportion of the population that attends religious services. You see that most of the large dots are set kind of concentrated down here towards the lower left end of this chart. Again, corresponding with that negative relationship between uh, religious attendance and the percent of legislators who are women. And most of the smaller dots are up in this area. So this is a nice graph now that you've identified it, and we could go through and probably have a much longer conversation about which of these, whether these states fit the expected relationships or not, and whether these states in the upper right fit this relationship or not. A lot of information is offered also by states like Nevada or Virginia over here, who are, uh, which are fairly far off this expected regression line and we could have a long conversation about that as well. But I'll leave that for another time. <coughs> uh, if you're interested, here are a few extra comments on how to alter the colors or the appearance of that graph. Um, if, if you're interested in doing that, I would suggest you play with some of these commands or, or, or go to this website to explore further. Let's get on with the multiple regression example as that's the, the culmination of this chapter. 
So for starters, multiple regression is often also called multivariate regression. It's also sometimes called, as I've mentioned before, OLS or ordinary least squares regression, sometimes simply called regression, although there's many different types of regression. And the thing to keep in mind is that this particular kind of linear regression, where you expect a relatively linear relationship between your explanatory variables and your dependent variable is the main method for doing most statistical analyses today. Today and for a long time now, uh, this particular method has been considered the bread and butter, the workhorse of statistical analysis. Even if you want to use a different method or a different model, m uh, much of the time, uh, scholars, policymakers, analysts, start with this model just to get a, a, a good sense of or at least an initial sense of what the relationships look like. The basic idea, hearkening back to the controlled comparisons that we did much earlier in the course, is that you want to test a relationship between an independent variable and a dependent variable, that is between a cause and an effect while controlling for a rival, a competing alternative explanation that is a, a, a separate cause. Here with regression, however, unlike with controlled comparisons using cross tabs or mean comparisons, you can include multiple other causes, right? You can include multiple other rival explanations in the form of multiple other independent variables. So you're not just restricted to one or two controls. In this particular example that we're going to look at, we include only two independent variables, college attainment and the percent of the population that attends religious services, but you could use many, many more. Indeed, I would strongly suggest you play with this data if you're interested and add other variables that you think might be predictors of the percent of state legislators that are women. But this is the basic model here. So again, we've got our linear model command. We've got our dependent variable, the percent of legislators that are women. We've got our first independent variable, the percent of the population that has a college degree or higher. And we've got our second independent variable, uh, the percent of the population that attends religious services. Sep our independent variables are separated by a plus sign. So zooming in here, if you wanted to add another independent variable, you would simply add a plus sign here and type in, you know, sort of IV independent variable number three, independent variable number four, whatever whatever that might be. Right? And you and you could continue on and on. Let's just leave it for now with our two independent variables. And then the last component of the command is the data set that is being referenced. So let's zoom back out and execute this command. Whoop. So I've got the command highlighted, hit control R. And here in the lower left, you can see the results in the form of output in the R console. Let's zoom in and take a look at them. Minimize this window a little bit. So here you see your intercept or constant, uh, the coefficient for college attainment and the coefficient uh, for religious attendance. <coughs> Both of these variables, the, the magnitude of their effect on the de dependent variable has changed, but they remain statistically significant. Right? Whether we look at the t-value, again looking for a value above an absolute value of 2, or looking at the p-values below a value of 0.05. Right? Both of these have an effect on the dependent variable, and um, that effect is statistically significant. In terms of the adjusted r-squared, we see that in combination, these two variables explain much more of the variation in the dependent variable than either one of them does in isolation. So I think at 
uh, at most, uh, well, the, attend the religious attendance variable explained about 41% of the variation in the dependent variable. The college variable explained about 38% of the variation in the dependent variable. Together, they explain 51% of the variation in the dependent variable. So let's zoom back out and continue with the example. This was the command we just executed. Again, we could restate that using the alternate syntax before, generating an a new object model 3 that is composed of the linear model of what's inside the internal parentheses in this, com in this command above, and then simply summarize model 3. To interpret the results, pr probably the more interesting part of this exercise, we go back to this equation for a line from basic algebra. Right? Y equals A plus B times X. If, if it helps to trigger some memory, uh, it does. F it did for me when I first came across this. Y equals MX plus B is the way the equation for a line is usually communicated in basic algebra. But in that equation, in Pollock's formulation, y equals a plus bx, a is the intercept, b is the coefficient, and x is the explanatory variable, right? The independent variable. If you have multiple independent variables, then you could um, extend this, right? y equals the intercept plus b1 times x1, right? So the coefficient, say, for college attainment times college attainment, plus b2 x2, the coefficient for religious attendance times the proportion of the people that attend religious services, and then you could continue on, right? In this particular case, we only have the two independent variables. So if we were to rewrite the formula for y seeking to estimate y, right? it would be y times 21.29. Uh, 21.29 comes from this value for the estimate down here, times 0.59 times the value of college. 0.59 comes from the uh, estimated coefficient for the independent variable there, minus 0.32 times a 10%. Minus 0.32 comes from this estimate of the coefficient for the second independent variable there. Now here for several uh, of you have expressed um, some questions about why we think about it this way, right? Why we think about predicting why or estimating why in this way. And this is interesting for a variety of perhaps policy relevant reasons, right? You the reason you have this equation in the first place is, is because you know why. You know the, de the value of the dependent variable. That's what allowed you to come up with the value for the, coef the intercept and, the val and to estimate the values of the coefficients. But if circumstances were to change, or if you wanted to play this out in the future, you might be interested in predicting why based on what you know about the factors that generate why. Right? Given the data that you have, what can you establish about data that you don't know, right? Given what you don't, given what you know, uh, what could you say about what you don't know, right? Whether it's the future or another a country based on what you know about U.S. states or a state or a province in Canada based on what you know about the states in the U.S. So maybe you have all of this information and you want to predict why in some other setting or in some other time. So with this information in hand, you'd be able to engage in some of this prediction. With this information in hand specifically, you would be able, you would be in the position to estimate some possible why in some other setting or some other time. Let's think about this more concretely. For instance, what female composition of the legislature would you expect under the most positive conditions? That is, what percentage of the legislature would you expect, that is, estimate, to be female 
at the realistic maximum value of college attainment in the United States and the realistic minimum value of religious attendance in the United States. Let's look at the distribution of, the in of these two independent variables to generate a sort of realistic example. Let me just correct this typo. To identify what the maximum value of college attainment and the minimum value of religious attendance would be, we need to examine some descriptive statistics for these two independent variables. We can do this with commands we're already familiar with, th say the summary command. Let's do these both at the same time. I've highlighted them, so I'll just execute them with Control R. And down here in the lower left, you see the results. You can zoom in just to get a better look at them. So with regards to college attainment, the state with the lowest college attainment has 17, 17 excuse me, percent of its population with a college degree or higher. And at the opposite end, with a maximum level, the state with the highest educated population, you could say, has almost 36 percent of its population with a college degree or higher. With regards to religious attendance, which has a negative relationship with the dependent variable, the state with the lowest level of religious attendance has 22 percent of its population attending religious services, and the state on the opposite end, at the maximum, has 60 percent of its population attending religious services. So with these minimum and maximum values now in mind, uh, again just to refresh, the maximum value of college attainment is 36 percent, the minimum value of religious attendance is 22 percent. So we could take these values and plug them into the equation that we established earlier to estimate the sort of realistic maximum value of y, right, sort of under realistically um, ideal circumstances. I suppose realistic and ideal are contradictory terms, but I hope you know what I mean. So under realistic conditions, what's the highest value of y we might expect? So we could use this formula to estimate that. There's the intercept, the coefficient for college, the maximum value of college attainment, the coefficient for religious attendance, and the minimum value of religious attendance. In R, we can display uh, the calculated estimate as follows using the print command. So we just type print and then inside parentheses write out the formula using the plus sign for addition and the asterisk for multiplication. I'll highlight this and execute it. So this would be the estimate of y under realistically best circumstances. I'll hit Control R to execute, and you see down here a value of 35.43. So let's zoom back out. So under realistically, re the realistic best circumstances, we would expect 35.4 percent of the state legislature to be state legislature to be female. Uh, an alternative way of typing this is simply to type the portion inside this parentheses, dropping the print command and the outer parentheses. That's highlighted already. I'll hit Control R to execute, and you see down here that you get the same value. Uh, so the state with a maximum college value and minimum religious attendance value can be expected to have 35, about 35 percent uh, of female legislators, or of, of legislators who are female. Notice that this is near the maximum distribution of this variable, which is 37 percent. Now, assume that some political actor, whether it's the governor, the executive, a political party, or some private foundation, or a non-governmental organization, we're really interested in maximizing the representation of women in the state legislature. Say that that was a policy goal. Assume also that they could al that they could aim for near perfect or near ideal conditions for this goal. That is, for women to reach the state legislature. That is, given the two hypotheses and related independent variables, assume that this actor could generate conditions of say. 
90% college attainment, extraordinarily high, and only 10% religious attendance, extraordinarily low. What would the composition of the legislature look like under these conditions, assuming they could reach those conditions? Hmm? So again, we would take the formula for the equ or the equation that we established from the regression, y equals the intercept value 21.9 plus 0.59 times college plus 0.32 times a 10% and plug in 90 for college and 10 for a 10%. That's essentially what we've done here. And in R you could use the print command to generate that value or you could simply type um, the formula. I'll just highlight this portion and hit control R and you can see the output down here. Let's zoom in. You can see that under these near ideal conditions, probably uh, unreachable conditions, 71% of the state legislature would be female. Let's uh, zoom back out. So that's under near ideal, really hypothetical conditions. But let's consider a more realistic question that uh, say a governor or a party or a private foundation might be interested in. Assuming an average level of religious attendance, that is, let's hold religious attendance at its mean across the states. What level of college attainment would you need to reach in order to achieve a balance of men and women in the state legislature? That is, in order to reach a kind of 50-50 composition of men and women in the state legislature. If we tinker a bit with the equation that we've established above, we can see that a state that focused only on education policy, higher education policy really, as a way of increasing the female composition of the legislature, would need to achieve approximately 70% college attainment to do so. So we, can, we know this by tinkering with, these, with the equation in this way. Right? Basically, there's three different ways of stating the equation here. Here's the intercept on the far left, the coefficient for college, the coefficient for religious attendance, and all I've done is plugged in the average value for religious attendance from our earlier summary statistics. It's 39% across the U.S. states. And then I've tinkered with the value for the college attainment from 90% to 80% to 70%. I could have kept going down further, but I, I reached my goal at 70%. I've got all three lines highlighted, so let's just execute all three lines at the same time. I'm going to hit Control R, and down here are our three lines. Let's zoom in to take a closer look. So these are our, well, that didn't work quite well. These are our three lines. The results 61.9, 56.1, 50.1. From 90 with an average religious attendance to 80% college attainment with average religious attendance to 70% college attainment with relig average religious attendance. So as I dropped, as I held religious attendance at its mean and I dropped the college attainment goal from 90 to 80 to 70, you can see the estimate for Y goes from 62% to 56% to 50%. So this 50% marks a perfectly balanced state legislature, right? pretty much 50-50 men and women. So if a political actor, a governor, a private foundation, NGO were interested in reaching a perfectly balanced uh, composition, in the state legislature, and this is all they knew about the way in which to do so, right? That you could do it either through affecting the religious culture of a state or through affecting the educational policy of the state, educational attainment. If they could do nothing about religious attendance or assume they could hold it constant and really wanted to focus on educational policy, on average, they would need to reach a U.S. state would need to reach a college attainment level of 70%. That is, 70% of the state's population would need to have a college degree or higher. 
in order to reach their policy goal of having a perfectly balanced state legislature in terms of the number of men and women. So let's zoom back out and that's it for this example. Again, this R script that we've just worked through has been uploaded to Blackboard. As you, uh, I strongly encourage you to download the R script, open your R workspace, get it all set up, open the R script, have all of this open, have your R companion workbook next to you, and then watch the video as you work through the R script and execute the commands and make sure everything works for you. Thank you.